It's a great privilege for me to stand before you this morning. I'm thankful to be back in Lubbock again. And I don't remember how long it's been, but uh, it's good to be here. Um, Tommy calls me sometimes on the phone and says, when are you going to be in this country? <laughs> Will you be able to come out to Lubbock and speak? And so it worked out this year that uh, I was able to do that. And of course, as has already been announced, uh, uh, that my wife uh, was finally able to come to the United States after uh, four different failed uh, visa applications. On the fifth application, uh, it was successful. And so she is here uh, with me today and will be in the States until the 24th of November when we will go back to Indonesia and that will be my base of operation. It's wonderful to be able to speak looking at people. Uh, for the last year and a half, all of my work's on the computer uh, because I'm doing things through Zoom, through Google Me, through QQ and other uh, internet platforms. And uh, I don't know if you've done any of that, but uh, a lot of the people, when they listen to you, they turn off their camera. So you can't see them. You don't know if anybody's there or not. And so it's wonderful to be able to, to see people sleep in person and not, you know, not have the, the camera turned off. And so I'm thankful to be here today. And if something happens to our PowerPoint as we go along, I'm just going to pull the plug out and I'm going to keep going. And you'll have to uh, just listen. Uh, but uh, I do a lot of my work now on uh, PowerPoint uh, because it's going out to places in uh, places like uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Taiwan, and China. And uh, I do a lot of uh, bilingual work, both in English and Chinese. I preach uh, at least twice a month in Chinese in Taiwan and in Malaysia. Uh, last month I spoke twice in Shanghai uh, via the Internet. And so I'm thankful to be able to continue to do that. Age is basically shut down. Uh, and so the only reason I'm able to work out of Indonesia is because my wife's Indonesian. And we were able to apply for a family visa. And then once I got to Indonesia, I was able to get a permanent visa that can be renewed every year. Uh, I've also now got my Indonesian ID card. And right before I came back to the States this time, I got my driver's license. Now, they drive on the wrong side of the road in Indonesia. And so it is quite a challenge uh, to be able to drive over there. And so anyway, it's great to be here. If you haven't met my wife yet, I hope that you will do so. And don't forget some of the drug mission reports for October out on the table where the light lady signed up for the lunch. And uh, all of my contact information is in that report. I'm thankful to have a part in the lectureship this year as we talk about a new heaven and a new earth. My topic is soul sleeping and the annihilation of the lost. Ephesians 4.4, 4, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. The one hope is something better that awaits us after we leave this earth. When our bodies die, our souls still live, looking forward to eternity in heaven. Hebrews 9, verses 27 and 28, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. In 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 54, we also read of the new body that we will receive at the resurrection. And I'm sure that there will be other speakers talking about that particular point. In this lesson, we will see examples of what is meant by soul sleep, what is meant by annihilation, and what the Bible has to say about it. What is meant by soul sleep? The doctrine of soul sleep is something taught by the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, and some other groups. And as Brother Hills just pointed out, anything that the denominations do, brethren think that's what we need to do. And so they adopt denominational thinking, denominational practices, I remember in 2012, I was in uh, Perth, Australia, and we went to visit with a brother who had fallen away. And he said he believed in the premillennial doctrine. And he said, I have a book that I have, that I use that is supporting my position. The book was written by R.H. Bowles back at the end of the uh, 
19th of the beginning of the 20th century. And so, even though that book was well over 100 years old, it was still having influence uh, around the world. And so, uh, not only did the, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists teach this, it has been adopted by others. And I know this will be covered uh, by Brother Bill Boyd later on in the lectureship. Therefore, when we die, we cease to exist. The dead can't think, act, or feel anything, according to the Jehovah's Witnesses website. When we die, we cease to exist, again, from the Jehovah's Witnesses website. A version of this doctrine is also believed by the Seventh-day Adventists. The Bible does not teach this doctrine. Instead, the Bible teaches that when we die, our souls are separated from our bodies. The body goes back to dust, and the soul goes to an unseen place waiting for the final judgment. Brother House is going to be talking about that in the next hour. The beliefs concerning soul sleep and annihilation are similar to the view of the views held by the Sadducees in the first century. In Acts 23, verses 6 through 9, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say, There is no resurrection and no angel or spirit. But the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Matthew 22, beginning in verses 23, and we'll go on through the chapter. The same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were with us seven brothers. Now, this illustration from the Sadducees reminds me of some of my brethren when they want to talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Let me tell you about this situation where we've got somebody that married, divorced, remarried, divorced, remarried. Tell us what the solution is. That's what the Sadducees were trying to do here with Jesus in regard to the resurrection. He said, now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken. I like the Chinese here. It says, Ni tola. That means you are wrong. <laughs> That's what the, how the Chinese translates it there in, in Matthew chapter 22. You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. I love that phrase, by the way, have you not read? One of the problems that we have not only in the world in general, but even in the Lord's church, is we have not read what the Bible says. And then, of course, he says, God did not say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Know what God said to Moses at the burning bush. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not I was their God. Exodus 3, verses 5 and 6. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. 
Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. What about Moses and Elijah appearing with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration while being observed by Peter, James, and John? Recorded in Matthew 17, 1 through 5, Mark 9, 2, uh, 2 through 8, Luke 9, 28 through 36, and then recounted by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. We look at Matthew's account here. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So here's Moses and Elijah appearing with Christ. Well, they died already. They're not going to come back because they're gone. And the dead don't come back, like the Sadducees taught. Also, Samuel appears to Saul after Samuel's death in 1 Samuel 28, 3, 11 through 15. He could not do that if he was annihilated. Now, Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived, uh, perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing, him, by bringing me up? Now, uh, we're just studying this in our family Bible study on Sunday morning with our daughters back in Indonesia. Samuel said to Saul, if you remember, Tomorrow, he says, tomorrow you will be with me. <laughs> they were going to die the next day. And so these are all indications that the soul continues to live on after it is separated from the body. James 2.26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The only passage in the Bible that mentions body, soul, and spirit in the same passage, is found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are many other combinations in the Bible, like body and soul, soul and spirit, and body and spirit. And you see the scriptures that are listed there that use some kind of of those combinations. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We've already noted James 2, 26. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the divide, dividing the thunder. I slipped into King James there. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Isaiah 10 verse 18. And it will consume the glory of his forest. 
and of the fruitful field, both soul and body. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Luke 24, 37 through 39. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Acts 2, 25-27. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. We sing hymns emphasizing our eternal soul. For example, my favorite song in our song books, It Is Well With My Soul. And of course, the refrain in the song is, It is well, it is well with my soul. There are other songs that we sing uh, that talks about our soul. Jesus, love of my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Soul, a Savior thou art needing. What shall it profit if we gain the whole world but lose our own soul? He hideth my soul. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Spend the light which has the phrase, souls to rescue, souls to save. Pure in heart, O God, and many others that we can find in our songbooks. We talk now about the origin and destiny of the body. Notice scriptures that talk about from where our bodies, our bodies came and to where they will return. Look at all of these scriptures that are listed here. Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. The King James says a living soul. Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Job 12, verses 7 through 10, but now ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Second Peter 1, 13 through 15. Yes, I think it is right. As long as, it, as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Second Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 8. For we know that if our earthly house... This tent is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we, for we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. 
We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Again, Acts 2, 29 through 33. Peter preaching says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his, did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. We will be judged for the things done in the body. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Romans 14, verse 12. So then, each of us shall give account of himself to God. Well, let's talk about when life begins. Now, almost all scientists agree that life begins at conception. You know, there's a lot of arguments about that in the past, but now especially because of DNA, you know, that everything is set at conception. Sex, race, hair, color, DNA, it's already been decided at conception. And if life does not begin then, then when does it begin? What evidence is there for life beginning at some other time after conception? A study of the Greek word, brephos, and the way it is translated, tells us God's thinking about the unborn baby. In Luke chapter 1, verses 41 and 44, the Bible talks about John the Baptist. Here is a brephos, here is a babe, in the womb. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe, Brephos, leaped in my womb for joy. Here's Jesus, who is the babe in the manger. Luke 2, verses 12 and 16. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe, not in the womb now. This is a babe that's been born. Wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It's the same Greek word, brephos. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph. And the babe lying in a manger. Then Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3.15, in the King James, it says, And that's from a child. The New King James says, And that's from childhood, that's the word brephos. Here, it's talking about someone who's grown up a little bit. First, it's the babe in the womb, then it's the babe that's been born, now it's a babe from childhood, that you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We see God's concern over the unborn child. Jeremiah 1, verses 4 and 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. Well then, when, on, when does life on earth end? Now we've heard through the years of 
near-death experiences. Of those who claim near-death experiences, most say they feel a great sense of peace and tranquility. Most also say that they are traveling in a tunnel with a bright light in the distance. Maybe you've heard some of those kind of stories. Very few claim they experience deep sorrow and torment. They do not express the idea they are headed for eternal punishment. But you know, in Matthew 17, uh, Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, the Bible says the few are traveling the road to eternal life. It's the many that are traveling the road to destruction. So how is it that everybody who had these so-called near-death experiences always see a light at the end and they feel peace and comfort? A person who is brain dead is legally confirmed as dead. They have no chance of recovery because their body is unable to survive unless they have some artificial life support. And James tells us in James 2.26, for as the body, <clears throat> for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And so, when the spirit leaves the body, then the body is dead. Now, Tom's going to talk about Luke 16, 19 through 31, aren't you, Tom? Okay. So, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this particular passage, but this passage gives us a picture of what happens after we leave the earth. And he'll be talking about uh, Lazarus and the rich man and where they go after they die. The Bible does not record what these people saw after they died and came back from the dead. Matthew 27, 51 through 53. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened. Now, many people misread this passage. And so, pay attention to what he says here. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. A lot of them stopped right there. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection. Not before. After the resurrection of Christ, they went into the Holy Spirit city and appeared to many. But the Bible doesn't record what they said after they came out of the graves. Lazarus was dead four days when Jesus came to raise him from the dead in John 11, 1 through 44. But nothing is said as to what Lazarus said after he came back from the dead after four days. Note also the example of Dorcas in Acts chapter 9, verses 36 through 31. We'll skip down uh, to the near the, the bottom, it says. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. But, but nothing said about what Tabitha or Dorcas said after she came back alive. The Bible doesn't give any examples of that other than what Tom's going to be talking about in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. That's true in the case of the widow of Zarephath's son in 1 Kings 17, 17 through 24. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What have I done to you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodged by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. 
And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. But again, nothing is said about what the son said after he rose from the dead. We see the phrase, breathe his last. The King James says, gave up the ghost in the Bible. The Bible talks about people who breathe their last, indicating their departure from this earth. Note the following examples. Abraham. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man full of years, and was gathered to his people. Now, if I was teaching in a Bible class right now, I'd say, okay, how old was Abraham when he died? You know, now, people don't like to hear my questions like that because they don't like to remember dates. But uh, you look it up when you get home. I'm not going to tell you today. Then Ishmael. These were the years of the life of Ishmael. 137 years. And he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Well, what happens after death? The soul separates from the body. The spirit returns to God who gave it. The body returns to dust. And the soul goes to the Hadean realm, either to torments or to paradise. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. And there are other passages that you see here as well, and the, the other one is Luke 16, which will be discussed in the next hour. The judgment will determine our eternal destiny, depending on the kind of life we lived on this earth and whether or not it was in keeping with the Word of God. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. John 5, 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, 
and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the thing that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. First Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. In Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11, the Bible says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity in their hearts. Except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. God has put eternity in our hearts. And we are looking forward to being in heaven with God and all the saints of all time for eternity. That is our goal in life. After studying our subject, the honest student could only conclude that mankind is not only mortal, but also has an eternal soul. Matthew 22, 31 and 32. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Once we leave our mortal bodies behind, our souls continue to live. What we lost in Adam was restored in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 45-49. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And is the heavenly man, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Man. Let us all remember the most important thing in this life is to bring glory to God by the lives that we live and then to make it to heaven. Matthew 5 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful. I like the King James here. Until death. Not just until death. Be faithful even if it means we have to die. And I will give you a crown of life. Today we've talked about the importance of the soul, that it is eternal. And the question that every one of us must ask, are we ready to meet the Lord in judgment? If not, then you have an opportunity while you're here today. If you're not yet a Christian, you have an opportunity to believe the gospel with all of your heart, to repent of your every sin, to confess your faith in Christ, and then to be immersed in water, so that the blood of Christ can wash away your sins and you can rise to walk in newness of life. And then as we are doing, to live one day at a time, putting the Lord first, living our lives as a follower, a disciple of Christ, a Christian, depending upon the grace and the mercy of God through our obedience to Him, to give us a home throughout eternity in heaven.